generations of when we grew up in church and now we sing it in a new little style I was lost I was in chains the world had a hold on me my heart was a storm I was covered in shame when he came for me I couldn't
got a new one for this congregation to sing, but if you've heard KSBJ, you've heard it. If you don't know it, you'll learn it because he lives. I believe in the sun. I believe in the risen one. I believe I overcome by the power of his blood. Amen. Amen. I'm alive. I'm alive because he lives. Amen. song we live because he lives that's the whole promise of the gospel and the promise of eternal life well it's good to see you this morning you doing okay everybody all right yeah that sounds a little iffy well I hope you're doing well this morning we're gonna we're gonna continue the series on Joseph this morning living faith so I want you to take your Bible and look with me in the 37th chapter of Genesis. Find your place there. While you're finding that, uh, let me just tell you, I um, I'm never cease to be amazed by you. And I'm so thankful to be able to be a part of this fellowship, much less be your pastor. Um, but you're a blessing to me. Your heart is bigger than this state. And... Um, and I love you for it. Last week we had the uh, children of the world here, and you were such a blessing to those little guys. And um, they, uh, what, did I say something? Oh, okay. Oh, there he is. We're being attacked. My wife's being attacked by a yellow jacket down there. All right, if he comes down here, I'm going to tell you the service is dismissed. Because... <laughs> Bees and me do not occupy the same geography. Kill it. There you go. God bless him. He entered into bee eternity right there. All right. Um, 
Anyway, we had the children of the world, and, and they were such a blessing. Never know what's going to happen here, yet. <laughs> the attack of the bees. Um, and that's just went out all over the internet right here. They're wondering what's going on in that church. Last week when we took up that love offering, I told you that love offering goes 100% to feed kids that go to bed hungry, give them clean water and shelter and clothing. And you responded with the largest love offering that we have ever given in this church. $24,000 was, was given last Sunday. And that goes 100% to buying those kids, not just the kids up here on the stage, but kids around the world, food and water, clothing and shelter. Thank you for doing that. Yesterday, uh, I saw dozens of people up here in training with uh, disaster relief and uh, getting ready. We're responding more and more uh, to disasters. We're getting calls uh, to come with our trailer uh, to disaster sites and help feed and uh, do things uh, for our workers and, and folks in those disaster areas. It was exciting to see that. I want you to be praying Tuesday. Kay is leaving with a team to go to Chile uh, for Mission Chile. And uh, we are partnering uh, to start a church there in Punta Arenas, Chile, where there is no evangelical church in that whole village, whole town. And what an exciting thing to be a part of planting the first evangelical church that preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ, that uh, God loves us and he gave his son so that we might have everlasting life. We're going to be a part of that. Pray for that team as they go. I want to mention to those of you that are on our Can We Talk team, we're starting up tonight. If you're on the prayer team, you're welcome to come, but our prayer team will not be functioning tonight. On the first night, it's orientation and information and introduction. Uh, so if you signed up, you're on a visitation team, we want to see you there. Uh, you're welcome to come. If you're on the prayer team, you come and you can sit in the introduction as well. Uh, but then next Sunday, we begin uh, our visits, and, and the prayer team will be functioning as well as we go out and visit. I want to say one other thing. I know I'm talking a lot before we get into this, but I'm really excited about Easter coming up here in just a few weeks. And I know you heard Jillian talking on the video before the service. I want, I want you to get behind this thing. I think this is one of the most creative things that we've ever done, that family Easter celebration the Sunday before Easter, Palm Sunday. It is going to be a lot of fun. After the service, after this service, we're going to have uh, lunch up there. I think they're maybe cooking hot dogs or hamburgers. Not sure what's going to be, but it'll be good. Uh, and, and there's going to be some fun stuff. She mentioned the classic car show, and we'll have some neat cars to go look at and see. It's going to be hot air balloon rides. You ever been in a hot air balloon? Yeah. And we're going to we're going to put the staff all in that thing, and we're going to stand there with BB guns. And, and, uh, but uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. But let me tell you what the whole purpose of the thing, the main purpose of the thing is, is it's going to be a multi-sensory presentation of Easter for the kids and, and for us. And uh, there will be things, if I'm understanding what Jillian's been telling me, uh, there will be a number of different stations where the kids will go and they will touch some things. Uh, a, another station, they'll, they'll smell. Uh, other stations, maybe even taste something. But in every station, it's going to teach them something about the passion of Christ and about his resurrection on Easter. And I thought, what a creative thing. So I want you to invite your friends. We, we ought to have a, just a blowout crowd that day. And on your way out in the foyer, we printed up some posters and some flyers about uh, not just that day, but also about our passion service and Easter Sunday. So pick some of these up and pass them out or post them around. If you live in an apartment complex, post them around on, on, on your billboards and things. Um, and let's invite our friends to come. It's going to be really an a neat day and a great time to teach 
our kids and, and for us to learn more about the passion and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. Well, today I want to talk to you about living your dreams. Now, we're going to be looking at across chapter 37 in Genesis, so we're not going to read a specific section of it right now, but it's our introduction to Joseph and, um, and what God begins to do with him. And, uh, you know, dreams are an amazing phenomenon. I learned some stuff this last week about dreams as I looked up some things, uh, just some details and facts about them. One of the things that I did not realize is this, that most of you, if not all of us, in this room dreamed four to six dreams last night. They've, they've shown in studies that they've done, doctors have shown that most people 10 years of age or older dream at least four to six dreams every night. Now, you may not remember them all. You may not remember any. I don't remember anything I dreamed last night, uh, but uh, we do. And so we're dreaming a lot during our sleep uh, at night. Also, we all have recurring dreams. You ever had a dream? You say, you know, I, yeah, I've had that dream several times. It comes and goes, you know, but we, we all have recurring dreams. That's normal. Don't think, you know, you've got some kind of illness if you're having that. And, uh, and there are common denominators in dreams. Um, now, it all depends on kind of which list you look at, but, but uh, I picked out some of the top five or six dreams. What would you guess would be the number one dream that people have? Falling. You're exactly right. So you're a bright crowd. I knew that. Uh, yeah, falling is number one. The second most common dream is flying. You know, we get like Superman, Superwoman powers and, and we get to fly through the air with no, you know, not being in a plane. You just, that would be really cool, wouldn't it? I would love to do that. Flying's number two. Uh, number three most common dream is a little depressing, but it's dying. Uh, we have a lot of dreams about, you know, we, we die. We get sick or we're, you know, whatever. Probably after we fall off a 10-story building, <laughs> you know. The fourth one is, you know, one of my favorite, although it's not fun to have this kind of dream, but it is kind of funny, and that is getting caught in public without your clothes on. You ever had that dream? You know, you, you, you're in school and you're sitting in biology class and suddenly you look down and there's more biology exposed about you than you want. Horrifying, horrifying dream, but we all have it. And the, uh, another one is being chased by somebody. Now, I can identify with that because here's some good news. You can influence your dreams. You can, you can help. You know, if you got a bad recurring dream. When I was a little boy, I had a, I had a dream that was a recurring dream. It was a bad dream. Uh, and there was this monster. It was actually a guy, but I couldn't see his face. He was just all white. And um, every night, and I'm probably like five years old, I would go to bed. I hated going to bed because I knew I was going to dream this nightmare. Now, I'm... I'm 25 now, and I still remember that dream, so it's, you can tell it's had an effect on me. But I, I hated it because this, I, this guy, this monster, would catch me in different places and would horrify me so badly I, it, I was paralyzed. I couldn't move. And uh, I remember one of the dreams was I would go to the kitchen sink to get a glass of water. It's the middle of the night, and I'm sitting there and drinking my water and the sink, and then there was a window at our house right over the sink. And when I was that young, we didn't have air conditioning. We just opened the windows, turned the attic fan on, and all of a sudden this guy would pop up in the window and start coming in at the window, and I'm paralyzed. I can't move, and so he's going to get me. He never got me in the dream. It was just the horror that he's going to get me. And so I so hated going to sleep because this, I knew I was going to have this nightmare that I decided I would do something. Now, I was certainly not a psychiatrist or a psychologist, but uh, there was a children's program that was aired locally in our town where I grew up, 
And it was called Cowboy John. It came on every weekday at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. School kids would watch it. And uh, it was actually, I learned later to my dismay, that Cowboy John was actually the weatherman of the, of the news uh, station there. Um, but uh, Cowboy John would have a bleacher full of kids here, and they would be doing some stuff, and his nemesis was Black Bart, and they'd come up and they'd always have shootouts, and of course Cowboy John always won. But they would show cartoons during this, two or three cartoons during this 30-minute kids program. And uh, what, he, what he always had the kids do before they showed the cartoons was he would look at the kids and say, what do we say? And the kids would say, cartoon, please. And then to my amazement, Boom, there was a cartoon on the TV. So I made a decision. I went to bed one night. I closed my eyes. I said, cartoon, please. Now, I did more than that. That's supposed to be funny. That, <laughs> have any of you ever done that? No, you haven't. So that's pretty unusual. But to my amazement, I started dreaming cartoons. So you can control those. Enough of that nonsense. Let's talk about Joseph for a moment. Joseph, we look at the life of Joseph. Joseph had a dream-like ancestry. You look at his, his family tree. His great-grandfather, Abraham, was the father of nations, the friend of God, father of the Jewish nation and father of the Arab nations. His grandfather, Isaac, wow, Isaac, the sacrificial type of Christ. Now, when I say the sacrificial type, I don't mean Isaac was, an, you know, a fake Jesus. What I mean was, when we go back and look in that story in Genesis of Abraham taking Isaac up on Mount Moriah to sacrifice him, it is a picture of what God was going to do a couple of thousand years later in that same place. Go back and read that story. It's a fascinating portrait God paints about what he's going to do with his own son. Where did Abraham offer Isaac, or start to offer him? Right where the temple was going to be situated. That's where the temple was built in Jerusalem. It was on top of Mount Moriah where Abraham was going to offer Isaac. When Abraham got ready to offer Isaac... As a sacrifice, what did God do? Did he let him go ahead and slit his throat? No, he stopped him and said, don't harm the boy. And Abraham did what? He looked up and he saw a ram caught in a bush. Now, let me give you a little geography lesson here. The temple was built on the top of Mount Moriah. Today, where the Temple Mount is, it's elevated. We call it a Temple Mount because Herod brought in dirt and piled dirt up and made a mount on top of Mount Moriah and then put the temple on there. But Solomon's temple was built dead on the ground. It was ground level. And if you're at ground level where the temple was, the only place higher than you on top of Mount Moriah is Golgotha. I have no doubt in believing when Abraham was down there, and he would have only been a couple of hundred yards from Calvary. Abraham looked up, and God had a male sheep stuck in a bush above Abraham. And God said, I am Jehovah Jireh, the God who will provide. What a picture. What a picture. 2,000 years before his son would be offered on that hill, God was already painting a portrait. That was Joseph's grandfather. His father, Jacob, wrestled with God at Bethel. God renamed him Israel, which means to strive with God. And Joseph. Joseph was a dreamer and an interpreter. Of dreams. So we look at the family tree of Joseph that we're going to be talking about over these next several weeks. We're, we're looking at a rich family tree, a dreamlike ancestry. Now, when we read through the Joseph story over these next several weeks, 
there are going to be three times that Joseph is involved in a dream setting. One of those is right here with his family. We're going to look at that in just a little bit. The second time is when Joseph is in prison in Egypt with the Pharaoh's cupbearer and the Pharaoh's baker. The third dream setting is in Pharaoh's house with the Pharaoh interpreting his dreams. And Joseph both has these dreams and he reads these dreams. Now, when we talk about living our dream in America, we got an idea of what that means. It means to have a nice house, a nice car, a great job, a beautiful family, two dogs and a cat. That's the American dream. But sometimes dreams can go bad. Sometimes dreams can go not the way we think they're intended. And we're going to learn from looking at Joseph's life that Joseph faced so many detours and so many delays and so many setbacks that we've got to believe sometime Joseph was saying, God, where are you? What are you doing? Some of you, in a room this size, I have no doubt, are right in the middle of some of those setbacks some of those detours, and maybe you're wondering, God, this isn't living the dream. This is living a nightmare. Where are you, and what are you doing? Well, let's look at Joseph here in 37. The first thing we discover, and this ought to give help and some encouragement to some of us, is that Joseph lived in a dysfunctional family. Look in verse 1 of chapter 37 said, now Joseph lived in the land where his father had sojourned, in the land of Canaan. He's living in Israel. And these are the records of the generations of Jacob. Now that's kind of a formula that Moses uses in writing down uh, Genesis. He uses it when he talks about Isaac and Ishmael and other of the patriarchs. These are the generations. And then After he says that these are the generations of Jacob, he doesn't talk about Jacob anymore. He jumps right in to the Joseph story. And he says in verse 2, Joseph, when 17 years of age. All right, guys, get this. He's a teenager. He'd be a senior in high school today. Joseph was 17 years, was pasturing the flock with his brothers while he was still a youth, along with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wife. And Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a very colored or multicolored tunic. And his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, so they hated him, and they could not speak to him on friendly terms. My goodness, was Joseph's family messed up or what? You look at this, and you think that is a train wreck in the process of happening. Number one, Joseph wasn't innocent of all of this. He was a tattletale. The Bible says that Joseph, were, they were out in the fields pasturing the flocks, taking care of business for their father. And we don't know what he said, but it doesn't relate that. But he comes back in and he gives a bad report. I don't know. Maybe he came back in and said, Dad, you need to know Reuben's out there just goofing around and we're going to lose half those sheep. You know, or Levi's out there and you wouldn't believe he's messed up and, 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 and he's, you know, cutting all the... F- fur off of all the sheep and we're going to lose all the wool and uh, they're just messing up. He, he brought about a bad report. And that didn't help the situation because Jacob was playing favoritism in the family. Now look at this. I mean, this is, this is almost embarrassing to read this because I'm thinking, what parent, what parent would do something like this? But But Moses tells us, he said, Jacob loved Joseph more than all the others. I'm thinking this dad needs some parental counseling, right? 
Who, who among us here would be so blatantly favor, favor, in favor of one of our children over the others that all of the other kids would know, well, he loves Billy more than he loves Susie or whatever. But Jacob did. Jacob loved Joseph, and, and the Bible tells us that he did because he was his son of an old age. Now, we know that Jacob had one other son later. His name was Benjamin. But to this point, J uh, Joseph was the baby of the family. And so Jacob loved him more than the others, and he made it obvious. All the other guys, all the other boys knew that Jacob loved Joseph more than he loved them. Don't you think that might have created some, some tension also between those other brothers and their father as well? It certainly did between them and Joseph. Not only did he love Joseph more than others, but he gave him a greater status. Now, let's talk about that coat of many colors for a minute. And I don't want to pop your balloon on that because it could be, the word that's used here could mean multicolored, but probably what the word means is a coat that showed status. In fact, there's, this word is an unusual word that's used. It's not used in any other context in the, in the Hebrew text, one other place. Uh, so it's hard to really tell what it means, except that archaeologists have discovered paintings, frescoes on rocks and other places uh, from this period of time. And they've seen with wealthy people, they've seen the depiction of coats that were different than what the normal people were. They were long. They were like knee-length coats, and they were long sleeves, and they were tied with a big sash. So probably when it says here that Jacob made him a multicolored coat, he probably made him one of these important-looking coats that said, you stand out above all the rest. You rise in status above all the rest. And so Jacob was playing this favoritism. And then, and then the Bible tells us, and the brothers hated Joseph. And they couldn't even have a good conversation. They wouldn't even talk to him uh, on friendly terms. What a convoluted mess of hatred and envy existed between Joseph and his brothers. Now, it's an amazing thing when we look back through the scripture and see how many times God worked through dysfunctional families. You don't have to go a long way in the Bible. In fact, the first family in the Bible, Adam and Eve, one son murdered another one. That's pretty dysfunctional in my dictionary. Noah. Noah, who built the ark, this faithful giant man of God, built the ark. God delivered him and his family through the ark. And then what happened? His two daughters seduced him, got him drunk, and they seduced him. Committed incest with their father. How about David? King David, who was unfaithful, committed murder against one of his own generals, tried to cover it up. Watergate was nothing compared to David's cover-up. And what happened to David's own family? His own son tried to steal his kingdom from him, tried to kill him. Absalom tried to kill David. God still used him. Eli, the prophet priest, his two sons were so evil in abusing the privileges and the sacrifices of the people in the temple that God killed them both on the same day. God uses, and God still works, even when it seems like our families are all twisted and bent. He did in Joseph's life. Well, we move to the next section, and, and we learn that Joseph gets these dreams, and it makes us want to scream out to Joseph, Joseph, keep your dreams to yourself. Look in verse 5. Then Joseph had a dream. When he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. I think Joseph knew what he was doing. I'll be honest, he wasn't a saint. 
He said to them, please listen to this dream which I have had. Now let me ask you, if you knew your brothers already kind of had it in for you, would you tell them this dream that you had? Please listen to this dream which I've had. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf rose up and stood erect, and behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. That is not how you win friends and influence enemies. <laughs> then his brother said to him, are you actually going to reign over us? Or are you really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. But we're not, we're not done yet. In verse 9, now he had still another dream. And he related to his brothers and said, Lo, I had still another dream. And I bet they were excited when he announced that. <laughs> Behold, the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. Oh, and he even told this to his father as well as his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream that you have had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come to bow ourselves down before you to the ground? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Wow, Joseph, brighten up here, man. You don't go telling those kind of dreams to a family that's already dysfunctional. I call dream number one the groveling grain. Joseph and his brothers, their sheaves are out, and each, of course, each sheaf represents one of the brothers, and 11 sheaves gather around Joseph, and they all bow down to his. Obvious what, you don't have to be a great dream interpreter to figure that one out. And then the other dream, I call the submissive stars. The sun and the moon and 11 stars all come and bow down before Joseph. And what happens? Jealousy grows. Hatred grows. I mean, if we were watching this in a modern day movie, the, the music would be in, getting louder and, and, and more intense and, and the cadence would be picking up and we would be thinking somebody is about to get shot. I mean, the tension is growing thick. But notice the last thing he said. But Jacob kept this, kept this saying in mind. It makes us think that old man that wrestled with God in Bethel, that still limped from God touching him and dislocating his hip, maybe was wondering, God... Are you up to something again? Are you doing something through my son that I can't understand? Well, we find Joseph getting caught in a plot. Look in verse 18. Jacob sends Joseph out to see about his brothers and to check on the flocks. And in verse 18, it says, When they saw him come from a distance, be, before he came close to them, they plotted against him to put him to death. And they said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. They couldn't even call him Joseph or their brother. They hated him so much. Now then, come, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. And we will say a wild beast devoured him. Then let's see what will become of his dreams. But Reuben heard this. Reuben was the eldest brother. Reuben heard this and rescued him out of their hands and said, Let us not take his life. And Reuben further said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into the pit that's in the wilderness, but do not lay hands on him. And he intended to rescue him out of their hands and restore him to his father. So it came about when Joseph reached his brothers, they stripped Joseph of that tunic, the very colored tunic that was on him, and they took him and threw him into the pit. Now the pit was empty without any water in it. This had to be a deep pit, one that Joseph couldn't climb out of. And so they sat down to eat a meal. Now get this picture. Joseph is over here in the bottom of a pit. And the brothers are up here, 
and they're eating fried chicken for dinner. And Joseph is saying, come on, guys, let me out of here. I won't be ugly anymore. I won't dream anymore. And they're just gnawing on their chicken legs. And as they raise their eyes and look, behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites was coming from Gilead. Now, these were their cousins. You remember Isaac and Ishmael, brothers? These Ishmaelites were coming from Gilead with their camels bearing aromatic gum and balm and myrrh on their way to bring them down to Egypt. And Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it for us to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Hey, we're not going to get anything out of this if we just kill him and make up some lie. Let, that, that's not going to profit us. Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. That was kind of kind of Judah to say that. And his brothers listened to him. Then some Midianite traders passed by, so they pulled him up and lifted Joseph out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. Thus, they brought Joseph into Egypt. Wow, the plot does thicken. Here's, number one, a plan to kill Joseph. And Reuben, his eldest brother, intercedes and saves his life. And so Joseph falls into this pit of slavery. Literal pit in the middle of the wilderness there. But to be taken to the pit of slavery in Egypt. But I want you to notice the last words of that section that are so important. Thus, they brought Joseph to Egypt. When things are really getting bad, and you think it couldn't possibly get any worse, it may get worse. But I want you to look for that thread of God's hand in those circumstances. Thus, they brought Joseph to Egypt. And that brings us to the last point in this story. And that is, never forget, God is still working. God is still working. We skipped a section. I want you to go back to it. It begins in verse 12. You remember Jacob sent Joseph out to go find his brothers, find out how they were doing, how's the flock, and he said, bring a report back to me. Let's read what happened in verse 12. It says, Then his brothers went to pasture their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to him, I will go. Then he said to him, go now and see about the welfare of your brothers and the welfare of the flock and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron and he came to Shechem. And a man found him and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, what are you looking for? And he said, I'm looking for my brothers. Please tell me where they are pasturing the flock. Then the man said, they've moved from here. For I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went out after his brothers and found them at Dothan. Let me say to you, there are going to be times in your life when the circumstances of your life are not positive. And you may be asking the question, God, what are you doing? And maybe some more things happen to you that are not favorable either. And you look and say, God, are you just trying to do me in? I want you to remember this story about Joseph, that even when the circumstances are bad, for those that love God, for those that have committed their lives to him, God is still at work. Get this picture. Joseph's at home. He's out playing racquetball or something. And dad comes to him and says, I want you to go check on your brothers. They, they've got the flock in Shechem. I want you to go see if they need anything, go see how the flock's doing, and I want you to come back and let me know if I need to do anything. So Joseph said, okay, Dad, I'll go. And so Joseph goes, and he goes, and he leaves, and he gets to Shechem, and there are no brothers, and there are no flocks. 
And he's walking around in the middle of a field. And he can't find any sheep. He can't find any brothers. And he looks and here comes a guy walking towards him. Now I'm not real bright. But I'm thinking that's probably not an accident. You think maybe something might have been ordained here. And this guy walks up to Joseph and he says, what are you looking for? It's obvious. He's lost. He's, he's hunting for something. And the guy says, what are you looking for? Joseph said, I'm looking for my brothers and I'm looking for their flocks. They're supposed to be here grazing. And the guy says, oh, they're not here anymore. They left. They went to Doth and I heard them say. What are the chances? You think that is just some crazy astronomical circumstantial accident? I think not. I think this guy was a man of God or an angel of God that God was orchestrating some events because let's ask ourselves this question. What if Joseph had never found his brothers and he'd gone back home and he reported back to Jacob, I couldn't find them. They've moved somewhere. I'm sure they're okay, but I couldn't find them. The story would have taken a totally different turn. But instead, a man just walks up out of nowhere while Joseph is standing nowhere looking for people he can't find. And the guy says, what are you looking for? Ah, they're not here. When I read that, I was reminded of the words of the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 28. When he said, for we know that God works all things together for good to those who love him, who are the called according to his purpose. You see, when the times are most difficult and circumstances are most twisted, Remember that God is still that grand weaver that is weaving the fabric of our life and of our eternity and his purpose is good and his intention is good. Even when circumstances seem bad, God is still working and he's still in control. Let's bow our heads together. Thank you for joining us online at West Conroe Baptist Church. We stream both our services live every Sunday at 8 and 11 a.m. If you're thinking about visiting us in the near future, you can find us at 1855 Longmire Road in Conroe, Texas. Visit our website at wcbc.us for more information on our church's full list of events, services, missions, and more. You can also give on our website under the e-giving tab. Again, we want to thank you for joining us online, and we hope to see you soon here at West Conroe Baptist Church.